Let us pray. Most gracious God, it's only by faith that we have come to this point and place in our lives and in this event. It is faith that has brought us over mountains, through valleys. It is by faith that we are blessed together in this virtual space today. And as we gather to reflect and remember the awesome and extraordinary work of the 20th century prophet, Martin Luther King Jr., it is our prayer that the power of your spirit would bless us in our time together and that you would guide our conversation. Moreover, when our time together is finished, that you would give us the courage and the confidence to continue in this journey of equity, past, present, and future. We ask, O oh God, that you would continually have your way with us, among us, in us, and through us. Sustain us by your power. Embrace us with your presence. Guide us in the paths of peace. This is our prayer, and we lift it in your name. Amen. 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 In regards to our occasion today, it is one that is familiar, and at the same time, so very important and significant and poignant that we not get so familiar with Martin Luther King events that we lose sight of the dream and the dreamer. One of the challenges of many Americans, those of us who live in the United States of America, we oftentimes will treat modern history as ancient history, that the events of the past, especially the events of the 20th century, really were not that long ago, that the work and the witness and the extraordinary sacrifice and service rendered by Dr. King and so many others was not a long time ago, not ancient history, but modern history. And when you consider some of the work that Dr. King did, but how it has impacted so many of us in so many ways. When I consider my own story, I am the seventh generation of my family in the United States of America, as we know of. However, I'm the first generation born with all of my voting rights. And that is because of the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and so, so many others. And when you consider the necessity of the work and the dream, the dream of equality and equity. It is so important that we continue to stand on this wall and to sound the alarm. When we consider incidents such as Emmett Till and his murder in Mississippi, if Emmett Till had lived, he would have been 81 years old, yes. ne nearly the same age of some of the politicians who now govern this nation. When we consider all of the things that have happened within the past 50 years and how far we've come, we need to continue the work because it's not ancient history. It's not even modern history. These are current events. When it comes to issues of voting rights and voting suppression, those are issues that we are dealing with today. And the work that we must do and continue to do to ensure equity, not simply as a dream of those who have lived before us, that's now a reality, but as a vision that all of us constantly work toward each and every day. So this afternoon, I'm excited for an opportunity to gather with some like-minded individuals to share important and essential information that we might have the courage and the rekindling to move forward, to make sure the vision, the dream, becomes a reality, not simply in our time, but for generations ahead. Thank you. Yes, sir. And thank you, Reverend Evans. We have selected for our theme this year in 2022, the African-American journey towards equality, past, present, and future. We remind you of some of our task missions which is to serve as a liaison between the community and local health care providers by creating partnerships to increase and enhance access to wellness, health education, and health care for diverse underserved 
and vulnerable seniors of color. Our vision, we envision a community in which underserved older adults of color can experience an improved quality of health care and achieve an optimal quality of life. And I present to you the current members of our task group. Faye Askew King is our chairperson, Walter Blackwell, Edna Jackson Gray, Gloria Edwards, Elsie Lewis, Daniel Lynn, Audrey Lucas, Joetta Mile, Leo McAvee, Tom Myrie, and David Tarver, and Jennifer Howard, who is the director of the Turner Senior Wellness Program. We're now going to offer one of our favorite musical selections of Lift Every Voice and Sing, I love it, featuring Alvin Chi of Take Six. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies Of liberty Let, let our rejoicing rise High as the going to come forward to introduce our presenter. You're muted. Sorry about that. Thank you, everyone. We are so excited that you are here to join us and for this special day and this special presentation. We're doing something a little different this time. Um, we thought it would be nice. I always am so sensitive to how isolated we are sometimes with this new pandemic and how much we miss being together as we have been prior to the pandemic um, for this event and lovely food and fellowship um, which is something we can't do right now. So to try to give us some ways to be connected, uh, we thought we'd break up into small discussion groups uh, for not very long uh, after Mr. Professor Wood's presentation. So um, we hope that, that that is exciting for you as it what is for us as we were planning the event. Um, so let me introduce uh, Professor Ronald Woods. Ronald C. Woods is a professor emeritus of Afrocology and African-American studies at Eastern Michigan University and a lecturer in the Department of Afro-American and African Studies at the University of Michigan. He served as the Michael O. Sawyer Visiting Professor of Constitutional Law and Politics at the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. The holder of a BA in history from Wittenberg University and a master's in history and um, 
uh, an attorney or lawyer <laughs> from the University of Michigan. Uh, Professor Woods was previously a poverty law attorney in Cincinnati, Ohio. Beyond his scholarship and teaching, Ronald Woods has consulted widely with corporate, educational, governmental, and nonprofit sectors, and regularly conducts professional development workshops on racial law and policy. He has been involved over his career in civic leadership through extensive board service and through shepherding youth and community transformation initiatives. His life's work has been cited in the United States Congressional Record and by the state of Michigan. The unifying theme of Professor Wood's career is the belief that success in achieving a more perfect union requires that we understand how the threads of race, law, and culture woven together has shaped our history. Synthesizing the strands of the journey, considering our current moment through the lens of African-American history, the presentation will utilize the occasion of 2022 Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. national holiday and this phase of national reckoning as the backdrop for an integrated look at the three topics identified for the 2022 task series. Um, Audrey will share more at the end of our presentation about those three topics that are part of this thing for our year. Um, and so look forward to, to hearing more about that. Now we will um, have a musical selection from the Ipsy High School Choir and they will be singing a traditional African-American spiritual entitled Over My Head. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Brian Paris, and I have an important question for anyone with arthritis. Which one of these foods? realizing that my playlist does not have the correct version of over my head. So I am going to grab that. And if you'd like to move on, we can find another place to put that, if that makes sense. Okay, fine. That's fine. Okay, Audrey. All um, right. Okay. I was looking forward to hearing that. So we'll hear it later <laughs> in the program. As our task group discussed a theme for this year's lecture series, we eventually settled on the theme, the African-American journey toward equality, past, present, and future. As many of you remember, our last year's overall theme was systemic racism. And our last program was on hope. And as I look back, it was my hope that our country would make more progress than what we have seen in this changing world. I, like so many others, have experienced great disappointment. So this year, we're going to take time to explore and look for ways to move toward equality by looking at the African-American journey, the past, present, and future, we hope that you all will join us in this exploration by joining us in our future presentations as we discuss the great migration, the history of protest, and voting rights. I am extremely happy now to ask our today's presenter to come forward at this time, Emeritus Professor Ronald Woods.
unless we're going to have that song now. You can let me know. I think she's still working on the technical pieces, Aji. Okay. Ronald, whenever you're ready, I'll go ahead and start your slide deck, but you should be ready to go. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer, and I am ready. Thank you. And as Jennifer is bringing um, um, uh, uh, the slides forward, let me say thank you to uh, everyone assembled here. Uh, Shirley, to the members of the Turner uh, African American Services Council, for their faithfulness over uh, uh, many years uh, to the focus of today's program. Um, and let me also say I, I appreciate, uh, secondly, just being able to, to see everyone. Um, the last two years have been hard on uh, group gatherings and various events that annually bring us together uh, as members of this community in greater Washtenaw County. Uh, and focused upon matters of justice and equality, our racial history and the future of our country. Um, so it does give me joy to be able to uh, look uh, briefly at the uh, various participants and get a sense that we are all in one location um, coming together around the mission of where we are in this nation and where we will be moving forward. So I wanna thank you all very much for this. And what I'd like to do, and I just would, um, um, I've got a, a slightly varied uh, way that I'll be thinking about this under the title, The Praxis of Progress and the Rhythm of African-American History. Uh, and as we move to the next slide, uh, let me say that um, uh, in the fall, I was uh, one of those um, uh, uh, able to take part in the closing session on the issue of hope. Um, and I'm going to borrow from a term uh, that I used at that point as I move into what I will say. But I do want you to uh, appreciate that we're here. We're celebrating several, several things. Uh, we're here celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. King. And I very much appreciate Reverend uh, Evans's uh, framing and shaping of both Dr. King and of the moment where we are right now. Um, but today's event will surely commemorate the life of Dr. King. It will also be the inaugural event for the series for this year under the title as uh, um, uh, Ms. Lucas has spoken of, the African-American journey toward equality, past, present, and the future. Um, but we're also coming together at an additional time. And that is that we are uh, on the cusp of our annual African-American History Month. There will be more as we talk about it. Uh, I also wanted to say that as we talk about this uh, a grouping now of three, uh, Dr. King, the uh, uh, kickoff of this series and Black History, that I think is very appropriate that Dr. King serve as a connecting link to all of this. You see, in many ways, the work of Dr. King and of the modern civil rights movement uh, sort of has uh, allowed this rendezvous with destiny that America has had, but haltingly pursued over the years. And when I say a rendezvous with destiny, as we'll talk about it, and as you well know, uh, our founding documents speak to, and Dr. King referenced this many times in talks that he would have, it speaks to the issues of freedom and liberty. And he would remind this country that we have an obligation, an obligation that I'll simply call to use the title of a very well-known book, not having to do with race per se, some decades ago, a rendezvous with destiny. But it's a rendezvous that America has often tried to evade. But one of the things that we will come out with as I move to the next slide is that though there has been evasion 
and meandering and wandering and retreat. It is a destiny that we just cannot get away from. And so as we think about where we are right now in this era of reckoning, two years ago or shortly after the, the death of George Floyd, we were as a nation relatively comfortable in talking about an era of reckoning. That is after well over a century, two centuries, we had finally become used to the idea, particularly as we saw life leave George Floyd. And it was so regrettable that it did take that kind of, of event to bring us to the point where we said to ourselves, just like we are at one of those kitchen table moments or come to Jesus moments as we will use in a popular sense, now we must do something. No more can we do this. And we seem very much to be on that era of, in that era of racial reckoning two years ago. But my, 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 how even just a few months can change things. We almost seem as though we are on the brink of literally a civil war in this nation. But the underlying theme that I want to bring forth is that both the flow of our history um, um, and many other things, and to point out that in, in our history, there does seem to be an endemic factor that there's a hope and a faith that there will be a breakthrough and if for those of my generation, that breakthrough may not be as imminent as we would like it to be, we do know that as we look to our various generations, and I'll just say generation Xers and hope that I'm in uh, a, a, a zone of correctness here, that they will be here to help bring that predictable future of progress into being. And so what I'd like to do today is to talk about, as we move to the next slide, to sort of group all of this under um, a, a theme of the praxis of progress and the rhythm of African-American history. As Ms. Lucas has indicated, the series this year will look not only at the flow of African-American history, if you will, but also to certain topics, the issue of migration in black history. And we often say that if you understand the causes of any human migration going back however far, if you understand that, that the study of migrations can in and of themselves be a study of human history as we examine why do people move? Where do they go? Why do they decide to stay there? Embraced in all of that is a matter of wars, is a matter of climatic circumstances, is a matter of poverty, is a matter of opportunity. And so that study of migration is so important. We will be looking at, and we'll be making some allusion today to voting rights to somewhat set the table. Um, and we'll be looking at something that we will call protest. And it's with that in mind that I've decided to sort of reframe a bit this in, in this way, the praxis of progress. What do I mean by the praxis of progress? In a large way, I mean that not just the P-R-A-C-T-I-C-E, but the praxis of doing something with a purposeful goal in mind, with a strategic plan over the years. And so we're going to look right now at the praxis of progress and the rhythm of African-American history. But I'm going to start with the rhythm of African-American history, if you will. And Jennifer, there is, uh, um, I'm not sure if it's coming across on only my screen, but there are um, uh, some, uh, some black grids that are over the screen. Uh, I trust that I did not uh, inadvertently enter those into um, uh, the PowerPoint, but if there's nothing that we can do about that, 
uh, we'll just proceed. Uh, I wrote it, so I should be able to carry it forward. Thank you. Um, so if we'll move to the- We've had a feedback from a couple of people that that is what it's looking like. I'm not exactly sure why, but we're, um, I'm troubleshooting. Well, do not worry, do not worry. We, we will work through this quite well. Thank you very much. And um, I do wanna begin, I think it's with the next slide, uh, with the rhythm of African-American history. Um, but I want to begin with something that also uh, recaptures um, observations that Reverend Evans was making. Um, history does capture moments or does present us moments that capture in certain ways many, many things that we would never otherwise think about as being captured by that moment. It presents, it captures the threads of our past. It reaches back into the past and brings them forward to the present. It frames the present and it scripts for us the very, very difficult choices of the future. That is what history is. That is why we have always in, in our societies valued history and the study of history as a way to understand our present. I'll just drop that in perhaps as a note for the ongoing debate about what can be taught, should be taught in our history or in our classes in civics, et cetera. It has been said that those who do not know their past or understand their past, as George Santayana would say, are doomed to repeat it. Others have said the past is prologue to the present and the present where we are right now is the prologue or the preface to the future. So history is a vital discipline. I will continue to make that case. We do not enter into the study of history to be comfortable. We do not enter into the study of history to be uplifted necessarily. We enter into the study of history so that the philosopher's words that the unexamined life is not worth living will be brought to bear on us so that we can examine our past, examine our present and give value to where we are right now. And that in many ways, and Dr. King was preeminent among public spokespersons, not historians per se, he was always delving within the realm of history and law to give us a sense of how the moment in which he found himself had brought us as a nation to a certain promontory, if you will, much like plates that have come together. It lifts up the earth and it places us there. And we are able to look back over history and get a sense of the imperative for our lives right now. So we're going to try to bring some of that into what we do today. Um, but as I say, I wanna begin by looking at that journey of America. This will necessarily, as you know, be selective, but we want to begin by talking about the way that American history has unfolded. Um, and Jennifer, if you would. That other thing that I want to highlight here, and I think we can appreciate from what we have now said, that history is not just an event. It is a coming together and amalgam of many stress points. And no stress point begins with what we see in the real and in the actual. It begins and takes seeds with roots that are eons old. And that is the case with America. We are looking at that 21st century era of reckoning, even if we try to avoid it. And to get back to that, we have to understand that, that era of reckoning starts many, many years ago. And so this is an amalgam of a lot of what we'll call discordant, uh, discordant themes, themes that perhaps don't sound right or don't sound compatible with one another, but yet are part of the American narrative. And this is surely a major part of that is America's challenge of race 
It is a variable that has threaded itself through the whole tapestry of our history. And it begins at the outset as we move forward. It begins at the outset of our nation's history. Using a couple of phrases that I'm sure most, if not all of you, could recite by memory, were we to, were Jennifer to put you on speaker and ask you to do it. We know that Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, rights that can't be separated and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We know as we go to our preamble to the United States Constitution, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, provoke the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution of the United States. And so there has been, as there always has been, but even more significantly now in a way that I did not think we would have to revisit that, a discussion about whether the dominant theme and fundamental proposition of America is that of freedom and equality. But as the next slides will just symbolically show, those that simply is not the case. And as we all know, for contrasting itself to the questions of liberty, equality, as operating principles in the development of America was the presence of chattel slavery. And we may have a couple of slides on those. If not, we will just continue. Chattel slavery, it exists and coexists with the issues of liberty, freedom, and equality. And I'll quickly shift to the next slide. And the next slide highlights contemporary works of, well, all but one of them, a contemporary work of literature that validates this. We sometimes think if we listen to all that we hear, that there is a legitimate debate about whether or not America is a country focused and premised upon liberty alone or whether there are other stresses and strains. Historians have never really argued. There's no debate about that. Now they have shaped the issue that is that we are a nation torn by these dynamics or at least shaped by these dynamics. Now historians have, have very aggressively differed in, in a robust way, differed about what that means and whether we have extracted that element from our body core. But the presence of those things as outlying ones or, 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 or as ones at the start. Of course, at the center there is the blue, the 1619 project. Um, the debate you're well familiar with, uh, Faye and others have led nearly a year long dialogue around the 1619 project that essentially uses 1619 as a starting point for much that is America. And we know that that has engendered debate. Some said that when you do this, you improperly skew the idea that America was founded in slavery. When we do this, we properly and accurately and empirically make clear that America begins on a dual track. These other works here, just by their titles, give you a sense of what they are. The Ledger and the Chain, How Domestic Slave Traders Shaped America. It talks about a phase of that internal Black migration from the up South to the deep South and how the domestic slave trade was a critical financial boon to America. From here to equality, relatively recent work. It is subtitled Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century, written by the, the economist William Doherty and a cultural historian, Kristen McMullen. 
And although the title would suggest that it's a dialogue about contemporary issues of reparations, what shape do they take? Should they tape? How should they be implemented? It is a rich history of the origins of America's economy and the way in which things move and filtrate through the United States economic system from that point as a final or as a takeaway point. Uh, the authors here project that the value lost in wealth to African Americans over the generations is equal to $11 billion in contemporary of, of um, um, uh, financial money. And then lastly, I wanna mention an, another book, uh, now almost 80 years old, written by the Trinidadian. Capitalism and Slavery makes very clear without, and, it, it, and, and again, none of this is really disputed about the impact of slavery on and chattel slavery on the development of world capital structures, particularly in Europe and in the Americas. So while there are those who either by, let's say, a failure to learn by ignorance or by a willful distorting of the history would argue that these propositions or that this is not a foundation point, uh, please know that the literature far, far, far um, uh, answers them in a very robust way. If I could just turn to the next slide here. But this is part of America's founding, this contrast between those documents. And even here, let, let me mention this. I'm going to sort of put a little highlight here. We know Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And I sure wish I was in a space where I could just be calling on, uh, or, or Jennifer uh, Faye could be calling on you to give your own rendition that you know you have of the Gettysburg Address four score and seven years ago. Our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation. I'm going to stay here, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men were created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure as it is. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that Justice Breyer um, in his retirement uh, announcement remarks of a couple of days ago, did make reference to this, unless I came in late on that uh, TV segment and it was from another speech, but he was talking about the significance of how we as a nation divided have a much greater future, but we must be about it, about the business of doing that. I want just to highlight those two phrases. If we were to write into this a kind of actual um, a real life operating sense, we would say on this continent, a new nation conceived in a contested liberty and dedicated to the debated proposition that all men are created equal. But I say this to indicate that, that these persons, and as I go to the next slide, that this issue of America being a divided country is not, whether we talk about it in terms of a term birth conflict, internal contradictions, contested propositions, whether we talk about it, this has been something that has been well known. If one wants to answer effectively the argument that slavery is an imported proposition to create division in our understanding of what America is as we, move to the next slide, we need go no further than the debate over the Constitution. Let me mention here also Gunnar Myerdahl. We'll get right back to that other point. Gunnar Myerdahl, many of you, uh, particularly in sociology and related areas, may have had to study a book. Now, as years have gone by, that has not been as prominent. It's written in the 1940s by, uh, overseen by Gunnar um, uh, Meyerdahl. Um, the writing of this multi-volume, um, uh, uh, many-unit uh, uh, work called The American Dilemma, the writing of much of that was by a notable core of African-American scholars. And we're going to re be referring to that a little bit later 
Um, uh, fear not. I realize we're within a short time frame. We won't be here all afternoon on this one. But the point is that there is a cohort of Black scholars under, undergirding the research that is here. Um, and in this book, Myrdal comes to a simple proposition. Um, uh, Jennifer, if you can move to the next one. The simple prop proposition in this book, he says, the Negro problem in America. Now, all of us on this call know that were we to try to formulate the issue of race in America as the Negro problem today, we could not get beyond the end of that sentence before the hands would go up, the beeps would go on and the voices would come up. Is this the Negro problem or is this America's problem? But what Meyerdahl said was simply this, and I say simply because it's pretty clear. He says, America is on the horns of a dilemma. It is now in the 1940s and always has been the dilemma. And as we know, a dilemma is a choice between two things, each one of which has, a, has an attractive proposition to it. In this dilemma, he says, the dilemma is that white Americans are really bound to the American creed of freedom, equality, and liberty, but they are also bound to the benefits of what we would today call white preference, white privilege has done for them. It has built up an economy. It has given them a sense of value that they may not otherwise have had. It has allowed a, 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 a bottom core of society to do all of the things that have to be done. So America is caught in a dilemma. When it listens to its better nature, it resolves that dilemma in terms of the American greed. And when it does not, it falls back upon realizing that the benefits of a racially, of a racial hierarchy, hierarchical society are ones that we can just not do away with. That was 1943. But again, America's birth conflict always been there. Gunnar Meyerdahl alludes to it. Some have called this America's original sin. It's been spoken to very effectively by black and white, Sojourner Truth, David Walker. It's been spoken to by Thomas Jefferson, his notes on the state of Virginia that talked about slavery being like a fire bell in the night that is ringing to let America know that there is trouble in the land. When he talked about fearing for America when he thought of the belief and knowledge for him that God was just, there will be a moral call or a moral claim to be paid. That's Thomas Jefferson. But we could even go back, and I don't have a slide on this, but many of you will know of the uh, now the late, and I will surely say great legal scholar, Derek Bell, um, in the debate that we have had about critical race theory, which has, which is a debate that has mischaracterized in all kinds of ways what critical race theory is. But in that debate, the name Derek Bell has come forth. Derek Bell, in a book that he wrote entitled, And We Are Not Saved, begins that text with a allegorical study. That is a kind of fact fictive novel that could never be real. An allegorical vignette entitled The Chronicle of the Constitutional Contradiction. He begins with a young civil rights uh, African-American female attorney who is down in Mississippi having graduated from Howard Law School, if I'm not mistaken, to engage in the struggle of that era, Mississippi Freedom Summer, et cetera. She engaged, she is in a tragic car accident, does not lose her life, does, uh, uh, is rehabilitated, but no one hears for, from her until the year 1987, nearly 25 years later. And that will be the bicentennial of the United States Constitution. She re-engages with the author here, and she says, you know, with what has happened to me, I have the ability to go back in time and change things. I feel the fact that it is now 1987, 
and nothing is different except that we have passed laws. But as I look at the data and the statistics, I don't see the change that we had hoped would be there a generation out. She says, the problem is this. We started our constitution embedding into that constitution through its three-fifths clause, through its fugitive slave clause, and through the slave importation clause. Not only the fact of protecting slavery, but because it was in our constitution, embedding into the cultural framework of our nation in a way that would go on from generation to generation to generation, a fundamental inequality and racial hierarchy. That was the problem. That's where we are right now. That's where even with that bevy of civil rights legislation that comes out of the 1950s and 60s and judicial decisions and executive orders, that is why despite that, we find the disparities, these quality of life disparities in health, in crime, et cetera. And so he says, she says, I think I need to go back and get to the fundamental problem. We started this nation out incorrectly. I'm going back and I'm going to engage the framers. And he said, well, how can you do that? They're white men, they're in Philadelphia, they're in a lot building, they don't want word to get out about what is happening for fear that it could get appended. And, but she says, I can do it. And she does. She goes back and she descends from the ceiling in a somewhat cylindrical tube. And you can imagine what the framers are saying. Some grab rifles and try to shoot her, but the bullets bounce off. Remember, this is allegory. And she descends and they say to her, who is this Negro woman and what do you want? And she begins to say, I'm here to tell you that what you are about to do to create this constitution that embeds slavery into the country is fundamentally going to create problems that generations and centuries of this nation will wrestle with. It will be very difficult to get it. You have to change this. You can't do these things. She engages in dialogue with the named individuals in the Constitutional Convention. And the beauty of this vignette is that all of the answers they give her for why they need to do this, all of the debates about it are factual debates drawn from the Constitutional Convention itself. There was no discovery overlooking the fact these framers understood the issue of slavery and what it would do. And then of course, Alexis de Tocqueville spoke, speaks to that as well. Let me move on to the next. I do wanna pick up my pace a little bit here. And so that constitution is, is developed. We referenced here and perhaps we can go on to the next, these three propositions. And again, it's important to remember that these are not simply legal propositions, yes, each one of these legal propositions, even if it remains in the constitution by virtue of the protocol by which these things are done, no longer have any bearing upon the legal framework of this country. But the danger <laughs> was that they were embedded in the psyche of America and embedded in that psyche, a racial hierarchy that as we know, and we just think George Floyd we just think Ahmaud Arbery and that closing argument by the defense attorney, that that has not gone away. Let us move on to the next, if you will. Thank you. Now that, and I'll just make this quick. Many of uh, we are all familiar with the fundamental decision. 1857, there's a very deep 20 year old, 20 year deep, history to that, so we won't go into it, but fundamentally Dred Scott is now before the United States Supreme Court saying, I am a citizen of the state of Missouri. The journey through which I went fundamentally freed me. I stayed too long in the state of Missouri. I should now be designated free or in the state of Illinois because Illinois doesn't recognize it. But basically he's here to sue his master at the time, John Sanford. He says, you're a citizen of New York, I'm a citizen of Missouri because I became free. His master says, you did not become free. Yes, I 
falsely imprisoned you by what you call false imprisonment. It wasn't, I did to you what I am entitled to do as an owner of a slave. And as well, and as for assault and battery, Dred Scott, you are a slave. I'm entitled to do whatever I did. But in this case, the Supreme Court looks at everything. They can't find an answer from the documents of the United States constitutional formation. And they go on a global search to say, what does the world think about the Negro? Could the Negro ever be considered a citizen? And they come back with the proposition, look, given the way that the Negro is thought of globally, there is no way in which the, con the framers would ever have considered granting citizenship to a Dred Scott. Dred Scott is a member of a, of a Negro race in which, which is a, he is a being of an inferior order. He is a black, he has no rights that a white is bound to respect. And that is what is being incorporated. Now that will be overturned as we move to the next. That will be overturned by the 14th Amendment. But the question is, while it's legally overturned, how long does that psyche permeate the American spirit? Reverend Evans referenced Emmett Till. Some of you may have seen the very recent movie documentary, Women of the Movement, or will otherwise be very familiar with the tragedy of Emmett Till. There is no way that Milam and Bryant could have done what they did, except that the cultural idea of Dred Scott and the fact that no black could ever be a citizen and no white had no rights that a white was bound to respect could have allowed what happened. And as we sat and watched George Floyd, the lingering penumbra of Dred Scott remains there. As we move on to the next, and I'll surely just get to, and what I'm trying to do here in this part of American history is to give us some of the foundational political legal points of that history and integrating other things. Wow. But we'll move on to that civil war. We will know that the war comes to an end, not by virtue of a goal to end slavery, but by virtue of the cacophony and calamity of war that does what it does. It's a much more complicated issue than that, but we know that that war does, uh, in the midst of that war, the Emancipation Proclamation is rendered, but that the 13th Amendment, ending slavery, the 14th, guaranteeing citizenship, equal protection, et cetera. And then that crystalline one, the 15th Amendment, guaranteeing the right to vote is very critical there. And in addition to that, as we move to the next, there is a whole body of civil rights legislation that is passed in the immediate aftermath of the United And those pieces of civil rights legislation give us a, a body of civil rights acts beginning with the Civil Rights Act of 1866, 67, 1870, 1871, and 1875. Many of them shoring up the right to vote. You may have, you are well now familiar that there are various civil rights actions being brought against individuals for, in the, in the case of George Floyd and other instances. All of this legislation relates back to the era of reconstruction when as to each one of these amendments, the last part was an enabling proposition that says, that says Congress shall have the right to enforce this amendment by appropriate legislation. So when you hear the argument today that the proposed Freedom to Vote Act uh, uh, slash John uh, R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is an overreach into state authority. We need only redirect those persons back to the fact that the 15th Amendment took care of that in 1870. And it gave Congress the right to enforce that. And by the, the Voting Rights Act, the portion that still remains standing, that issue of intrusion uh, is nothing but someone expressing the fact that they are not fully aware of what that history is. And that is part of what this praxis of progress that is on us and everyone else to carry forth the learning that needs to be done on those propositions. And for our genera generation Xers, those uh, yet not in that generation and those beyond. 
and we'll move to the next, if you will. Thank you. But I've also said that as to these amendments and these reconstruction acts, it's very important for us to recall that all that we did with as major as it was in the 1950s and 60s with the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of 64, and the Housing Act of 68. All of this was already in place between 1865, uh, the 13th Amendment, and 1875 with a Civil Rights Act to ban discrimination. What happens? Why does that, why is it necessary that we go through this lag time of a century and a bit less here. What happens is that we have lax federal enforcement at all uh, in, in much of this. We have courts that are interpreting pieces of law, most prominently Plessy versus Ferguson. Do, we do want to remember that it was a court that took that Equal Protection Act law and clause, if you will, and said that no, it doesn't mean that black folk can go wherever white folk can go it means simply that separate but equal is no. The point I'm making here is that this is where the praxis of progress comes in. As generations prepare themselves for the kinds of things that will put them into positions to deliver for the cause of America's rendezvous with destiny. And, and when we see, for instance, a, 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 a trio, of African-American women having their names advanced as potential persons to go on to the United States Supreme Court. Understand that this is what is needed in this period of time so that the learning that begins in kindergarten or before as you sit and you read with your children and you infuse them with the idea that they need not only be those who open the Supreme Court, who, who clean its floors, who serve in the lunch cafeteria that even a Thurgood Marshall could not end. That's not where the sky or the sky ends for them. The sky is one of those seats in front of the persons who petition there. A little bit of a detour, but not so much if you understand what I'm meaning here. And so we go through a period of time where we enter Jim Crow segregation. We're well aware of this, Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, um, and then we, we are, if, if we can maybe move to the, well, I'll stay right here for a minute because I can uh, uh, sort of highlight here. We open up this 20th century with the African-American population, still primarily well over 90% a Southern and rural population. Now, remember, we will often say that the great black migrations do begin in that period of time. And in a certain way, they are. But we also want to recall that the first migration was the involuntary migration of black folks from Africa to the Caribbean, to North America, to Port Comfort, Virginia in 1619. And then that internal migration, again, a forced migration of black folks from up South to deep South and all around and the division of families, et cetera. But we come, to the period now, early 1900s, where the coalescence of issues of industry, of technology, have all come together, and of war, have all come together to create job opportunities for many within the northern and mid, and within the eastern, northern, midwestern portions of our country. And no doubt for many of you, on this call, many of you, if you begin to trace, how is it that you find yourself here in Michigan or Washtenaw County or elsewhere, there will be someone who from 1900 to the early uh, um, uh, uh, 1970s or so had made their way. So we're familiar with that uh, great migrations as they are called, but there's also a migration that creates the Tulsas of the world that, that went from the South out to, um, uh, 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 out to Kansas and Oklahoma and created the dynamics there. But as we know from Tulsa, 
that overhang of white hierarchy never did stay in Texas. It never stayed in Georgia. It never stayed in Alabama. It moved there and hence we had 1921, the Tulsa race riots. Uh, and of course, 1923, Rosewood, Florida uh, as well. But we also, as we talk about this migration, create that, that, that competition between black workers, white workers for those spaces within cities. And as we talk about 1917 in East St. Louis, Illinois, the racial violence of there, the racial violence of 1908 with Springfield, um, um, uh, with Springfield, Illinois, the racial violence of 1904 in Springfield, Ohio, not as prominently known as one, but yet one nonetheless. Then we come to that great red summer of 1919. The war is now over. Blacks are coming together there in that portion of Chicago. You know the tragedy of the young man who is stoned as he crosses that imaginary line that separates where Negroes or colored folk can swim and others cannot. But there is that violence that is invested there as we hear the Negro uh, soldier is coming back and finding that violence. And the great Harlem Renaissance poet, Claude McKay will pen that poem, if we must die, if we must die, it will not be like hogs pen etc. And so we get to this point where the black population basis of, of, of America are no longer just in the South. Booker T. Washington had argued, don't leave the South. We know the white man here and the white man knows us. This is our best proposition. They said, Booker T. Washington, we believe that you are what we are now going to begin calling an Uncle Tom. Mr. Washington said, no, you need to listen to me. Where land is power and where you are with the land, there is your political base, there is your economic base. We'll just put that in there right now to see thought for discussion later on today, tomorrow, elsewhere, as you sit around. Um, because he would say to you right now, he would say, look, I told you not to leave the Georges and the Stone Mountains and the Fort Gaines. I told you to stay here. Georgia politics would look, look different. I just throw that in, not as a serious proposition, but as an idea of how these debates go. But this is the migration. We know this is how the Chicago's, the Harlem's, the Detroit's evolve. We also know that this is how we begin to see the uh, evolution of, of, of the racial riots that come out of uh, Harlem, Detroit, 1943, later 1967 rebellions, et cetera. And I wanna mention some of you will be familiar with a great work by, the, by Richard Wright. It's called 12 Million Black Voices, focusing upon images from the rural South and mostly it appears Chicago, Illinois, 1944, a very uh, um, a, 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 a graphically presented presentation. You know, the more recent work, um, um, uh, uh, by uh, Isabella Wilkerson on um, the warmth of other sons uh, having to do with migration. And then the discussion that we will have now. There's so much to pin in there. I won't go further there on that, but I will come to this and say that in the course of this 20th century then, the, the, the call for rights begins to gain steam as it always will even before World War II is over, uh, even before World War II starts, there's a concern being expressed that in all of the great things that are done by the New Deal legislation, why is it that agricultural workers and domestic workers are left out of the social security network at that point in time? Why is it that these things are happening? You'll be familiar that in 1941, what would have been the first March on Washington was threatened. Um, um, uh, a. Philip Randolph says, Mr. Washington, or excuse me, Mr. Roosevelt, the Negro, if answered, if called to serve in this war, will answer. Why can't the Negro work in the factories and the war make the war industries 
within this country. Um, ultimately, that is resolved with the issuance of an executive order that begins what many say is actually the modern civil rights movement. These things will always differ. The Negro soldier returns having fought for the four freedoms and asking where are our freedoms. Um, ultimately, that leads us into the desegregation of the armed services in 1948 under Harry Truman. It leads us into a series of important Supreme Court cases through which the NAACP is establishing the framework for what will ultimately become Brown versus the Board of Education. And in May of 1954, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Warren, newly appointed, safe Republican governor, um, a, a, a conservative voice from California, uh, confounds President Eisenhower with his ruling, with leading the ruling by a unanimous court that the concept of separate but equal is inherently unequal, or that it, separate education is inherently unequal and calls for the full desegregation of schools. Those of you who are educators in the room know that that is a journey still in the making, but it's a journey that we were able to begin with Brown versus the board. We're now positioning Dr. King into the mix here. Dr. King having now completed his study, having been influenced by uh, Howard Thurman, having been influenced by persons uh, such as Benjamin E. Mays and uh, under um, uh, the, 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 the preaching and the pastorship of, of Reverend uh, Dr. Vernon Johns has now, as he completes his dissertation, come to Birmingham, come to Montgomery. As you know, a proud woman who has been strongly and long time engaged in the struggle, Rosa Parks, small demurring lady becomes the force that breaks it all loose, breaks it all loose. And here we then begin the modern civil rights movement. Dr. King is asked to provide the leadership. Um, he does say yes, uh, although he didn't really have a lot of opportunity by virtue of the time frame that he was given really a matter of hours before he was told that hundreds of people would be coming to his Dexter Avenue Baptist Church for directions. And thus a brief but brilliant 13 year public life begins that is transformative for the world and the nation. Dr. King will lead the various struggles in the cities of the South, will move to the cities of the North, the Clevelands and the Chicago's, et cetera. And I might add, would often speak at my church when I was growing up, uh, Zion Baptist Church in Cincinnati, as he was a, uh, a, a colleague of Reverend L.B. Booth and Fred Shuttlesworth and Gardner C. Taylor in, um, 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 uh, and of, um, of Reverend Moss in founding the, the Progressive National Baptist Convention. Uh, at the time, I knew of him as a great figure but I just did not have the acuity at age nine and 11 and all to say, you need to be more attentive to the greatness that is here. Part of me just knew that we as young people could not go into the sanctuary so that older people or others who were coming to hear him could not. But nonetheless, it has its impact upon me as a then what would have been a generation excerpt listening to and knowing that Dr. King was there. But that movement unfolds. We go through the various other ones. I won't do those now. We know Mississippi. Um, uh, we know the tragedy that occurs there. Uh, we know the movement. We know the pressure for the voting rights that does come. Um, lastly, I'll, I'll say under this one, and then I'll make a quick shift to the other. Um, can I get a time check? I'm feeling that I'm, um, and I put my phone elsewhere. Can I get a time check? Somebody wants to shout it out for me. It's 214, Ronald. In other words, Faye, as I read your language, I need to wrap this thing up. Okay. All right. Well, look, thank you. Let me just say the Massive Voting Rights Act had a critical provision to allow federal oversight of changes that were to be made that was declared unconstitutional in 2013 by the Supreme Court in Shelby versus Holder. The push now in what is now a combined piece of legislation mm -hmm. is to respond to what Justice Roberts said, said you can recreate some of this, but you can't do it 
under the standards that you were using then, uh, Congress has still not been able to do it for reasons that we well know. Let me now shift to this last section and I'll make this a lot shorter than I otherwise would have. It's called the Praxis of Progress. And if we could just shift to the next uh, um, uh, slide on this. I want us to think, um, while thinking about this in terms of protest is important, I always like to think of, us, of this as well as a Praxis of Progress. Protest, not just having calling for what you should have, but taking your future into your own hands in a very direct way. And over the centuries since 1619, we as an African-American population have inquired about, studied about things, we've examined them, we've come up with strategic projections, and we have come up with actions to say, how can that be advanced? If I can move to the next slide. I want to suggest that this idea of a praxis of progress or a tradition that we have had ranges over everything from academic work that, that might be done, the literature that we might bring um, um, uh, forth. And Washington County has had such rich engagement in literature, in the artwork of a John Lockhart uh, and uh, 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 our, our local doctor, um, uh, James L. Lee and the painting that he does when he's not attending to his dentistry. Um, I could just mention so many other names right now. It involves all forms of cultural. And I could just stay for a whole session on the issue of the black church, sermons, religion, as part of that praxis of progress. Please excuse the spelling that I put to progress there. But the black church, the critical communal organizing component for wash blacks in Washington County, for blacks throughout the Western hemisphere, I will say, in, in the many ways, when we think about the Gardner C. Taylors, the Howard Thurmans have, I, as I mentioned, the Kane Hope Felders who have talked about this, the whole issue of black theology and the questions, all of these have been focused upon, yes, the issue of soul salvation and the strengthening of a spiritual and religious relationship with, with, with a higher being. But it's also about how do we advance for those of us on earth and meet the obligations that have been given to the church to address the homeless, hear the knock on the door from the refugee, et cetera, et cetera. But we can continue this on. Political manifestos, some of which have been given here in Washington County as over some 50 years ago. Now I would say maybe 53 to four years ago, uh, a person many of you will remember a um, uh, returning Korean War veteran, Charles Thomas, would uh, come to the, enter the pulpit of, if I'm not mistaken, as I am told, um, uh, the Presbyterian Church on, on Washtenaw Avenue and say to the church, I'm here to deliver the Black Manifesto that says that the white Christian church, and we will begin with the white Christian church, must be more responsive to the needs of African-Americans in terms of what we will now call reparations. But there are the oratorical pieces, the oratory of black life and culture, the legal arguments that, 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 that dictate what has happened, the cross-generational activism ranging from the era, well, throughout the history, it involves the slave trade or um, a slave resistance, et cetera, engagement, protests, Black Lives Matter, the various things. I want to just group all of this and if I could go to the next slide and I'll round this out. Um, as what are, that over the years, we have as a people and with allies engaged in the praxis, the strategic, practical, ongoing attention to the progress, not only of America, uh, not only of the African-American, but to the progress of the nation as world. Dr. King spoke of the urgency of now, and we go from the urgency of now in 1963 to the praxis of progress as has always been. Remembering as Dr. King said, that progress, and I should have taken, didn't mean to put the quotations there um, um, uh, because this may be more of a, of a paraphrase, 
that progress does not roll in on the wings of inevitability, but on what we as people do to make it happen. Let me stop with that, Faye, uh, uh, Audrey, and um, open up as you might wish us to do. For the sake of time, what we're going to do is go right into the Q&A so we don't really have time for people to report out and share. Um, but I encourage you that if there was anything from your discussion that you would like to share as part of the Q&A, that's great. But I think that while we have Professor Wood still here with us, if people have questions that they would like to address to him, that would be great as well. So you are all muted. And so um, if you want to speak, uh, there is a technical piece that allows you to raise your hand at the bottom of the screen and uh, we will unmute you so that you can ask your question or make your comment, okay? Use the chat box if things aren't working and you have questions and we will try to monitor the chat as well, okay? All righty. Mine doesn't have a raise your hand. Okay, well, uh, Ronald, if you wanna speak, go right ahead. You no, know, in uh, the groups I were in, the individual groups, a couple of them, we were just thankful to Dr. Ron Woods for um, where we were impressed by his credentials and everything that he fights for. He's educated. And uh, I was very impressed by sitting in, you know, and the Reverend, his prayer, the words. I was very impressed by sitting in today. And um, it's always a thrill for me to see an educated Black man you know, to uh, be very, very learned. I think one of the individuals calls him, called him learn. And um, just everything he fights for, you know, advocates for, I'm impressed by that. A lot of things often weigh upon my heart about civil rights and being, you know, just to have freedom in America and equal treatment. All those things weigh on me sometimes as a black man, you know, and I'm just thankful to be here today. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Wilson, and we're happy that you joined us. Does anyone else have any questions? Please okay. put them in the chat. It'll be much more efficient um, because we have a, a lot of a lot of people here. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, there are laws on the books that have, well, there are laws that have been written and they've been passed, but then there has made no difference for Blacks in America. What can be done to make a difference to see us, you know, try to get us moving here? Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, Professor Wood. Uh, thank you. And let me first say thank you to Ms. Smith and to <laughs> Ms. Uh, Cheryl Jones, uh, two of the teachers of my children. Uh, <laughs> so, so I just, I, now I, I'm not calling out anybody else. I don't want to get in trouble, but. Um, uh, and then there are other people who have been supporters, et cetera, in various ways. But I just want to say thank you to uh, the two of you uh, and, I, and my children. Uh, I'm just proud that they've all become very good parents. So I want Excellent. to give you a shout out for all of that. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, but thank you very much, uh, Ms. Smith. I, I appreciate that question. Um, yes. The, the problem is, um, if I would just use as a, 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 a backdrop, um, and I didn't make the point that virtually every piece of civil rights legislation that was either passed or judicially decreed during the era of what we call the civil rights movement had already been there as a part of either the 13th, 14th or 15th amendments or as a part of that body of civil rights legislation, beginning with the Civil Rights Act of 66, 67, 70, 71, and then 75. The question there, uh, and, and so if you could sort of put these things side by side. Now, of course, there are contemporary nuances for different things. Maybe the act was not in the same form, but we could have done with that bevy of legislation then, what we tried to do and are still trying to do with that modern civil rights uh, era legislation. In order, I, I, uh, I think there are key 
sort of touchstones wherever the issue of law and its enforcement comes into play. Number one, who is interpreting the law? Um, we still are at a point where we do not have adequate representation among the broader American, uh, with, from within the broader American population um, uh, uh, on our benches, uh, courts at all levels. Um, and some of you will be much better prepared and versed than I to point out that in say, uh, we've talked about it here in Washtenaw County, that the number of discretionary points between a, a traffic stop or a stop of a youth of any color or, 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 or gender between when that first engagement occurs and when say an ultimate disposition is made is somewhat approaching maybe two dozen or so. In other words, that someone at each of those points has to make a decision, a judgment call that can go either way, beginning with, do I sit you in my car, my squad car, call your mother and father and tell them to come get you, or do I take you down and begin the booking process? And it continues from that point on, just in the criminal justice arena. But let me say that number one, who sits on the courts? So mm -hmm. important. Yeah. Um, and we have a much larger number. I understand that um, 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 uh, Ms. Slay, who was a candidate for the county prosecutor's job a, a, a election or a half or so ago is considering uh, a, a run for a judgeship. Um, I don't say that as an endorsement, although she's a really good person. I, I, uh, uh, I say that only to indicate that the more, the greater the number of us or persons of color who sit in judgeships all the way up makes a big difference. I say secondly, that uh, those of us who sit, and I say us, meaning just collectively, the greater American population, those of us who sit in the prosecutor's chairs are very important. Um, uh, uh, I know there was at one point an orientation that well, you don't want to be a prosecutor that just does the work of, of, of the company or the man or whatever. But you had to remember, it's the prosecutor who decides whether or not a case will be brought. Um, there's a big difference, color aside, in who is our attorney general between those who might sit say under a given administration and those who sit on another. So, and beyond that, it makes a difference who is judicially a clerk to a Justice Breyer or to a Justice Rehnquist to Justice Roberts. So all of this is really talking about the pipeline component of law making, law enforcement. Lastly, of course, there are the legislative branches. Our city councils, our um, uh, uh, county boards, state legislatures. So I say yes. The fact that laws seemingly go unaddressed is in large part a component of the lack of persons of sensitivity to these things within the pipelines. So the more folks who are going to, I'm just saying going to law school, it makes a difference who sits in the county sheriff's office, who sits in the county prosecutor's office, chief of police, county administrator's office. So um, um, uh, Ms. Smith, I just want you to know, uh, and to all here, uh, you, know, it's, you know, again, I'm not gonna call names because I see too many people I know, that the work of the generations that we represent is paying itself off in the greater number of folk who are sitting on committees involved in what a, 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 a legal historian or, or legal anthropologist, his name was E. Adam Hobel, H-O-E-B-E-L. He said, there are all kinds of law jobs out here. 
not meaning a lawyer or a judge, but people who are involved in the grand matrix of our legal system. So I know that's not the best answer, um, but the one that I can say will ultimately get towards some resolution, not immediately, will be um, is trying to encourage our youth to mm -hmm. say, sit on these boards, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And go oh, in and teach it. Go Thank and you. Teach. Great Thank job. You. Great go job. Thank you. Mr. Blackwell has had his, has had his hand up for a minute. Mr. Blackwell. Need to unmute him if you can, Jen, maybe. If, if Blackwell oh, was, was alive, he will be 91. I'm 91. And I got into the civil rights in the 1950s. And now it's 2022. And the thing about it, we talk about change. From the time that I started to now, how long do people have to wait? Because like we talk about legislators and things, the laws that they don't adhere to the laws that they have. And they are circumventing the constitution which makes the laws. And how can you hope to get any advancements when you got all of this corruption and, and people not allowing uh, property to be made. And that's what makes it very frustrating because we, we all can't live forever. And right now the constitution is supposed to have a basic rule, but nobody plays that in their mind. So it's just a sad situation for a young person to look at and try and get hopeful because when you tell, look at the story, how are you gonna win? Um, I think, Mr. Blackwell, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to take a shot at this. I think that 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 is I think that we have not done our jobs as members of this democracy. Um, and this democracy only works if we all are fully actively participating in it. And I think that we have not held many of our legislators accountable. Um, and I think um, we are where we are today, not only because of the history um, that Professor Wood shared with us, but also um, how we got to this moment in time. But we are over time. I want to honor our time here. And so I want to thank you all for coming. Audrey is going to um, close us out, but uh, we're going to put our survey uh, into uh, the chat and we really encourage you to complete that survey because this is the first time we've ever tried to do breakouts. We know it was a little clunky, but we want to hear from you to see if this was a way for us to try to connect uh, when we are doing future presentations in this series. Um, okay. yes, May I um, say, um, I'm, I'm, let me just say this. I want to thank uh, Mr. Blackwell for his observations. And I want to thank others who I know were already engaged in the journey or in the praxis of progress when I arrived in Ann Arbor. And by their doing what they did, you know, I can live where I live, have the kind of job I have. Yes. Hard I in other words, but look, bottom line is I want to thank you for that. And I, I, and, and, and I want just to validate what you say. Now, if I were talking to a 13 or 14 year old, I would talk to them a little bit differently. And I would simply tell, tell them the difference between life when the Walter Blackwells of this community started and life now. Mm -hmm. And I could just tick off things that can happen now that never would have. Faith, thank you for being thank so you. Thank you, Ron. And, you know, I appreciate uh, you um, acknowledging uh, Walter's comments. Um, and I am trying to focus on people's time, but I appreciate your acknowledging our elders because that is what we should always be about. Uh, and speaking of elders, uh, this is Dolores Washington, another one of our staunch uh, supporters of our MLK events over the years. Um, is still a lovely pianist and she is going to play for us 
while you complete your evaluations, which are um, linked, there's a link in the chat for you to click on and you can complete the survey. Um, after Ms. Washington um, finishes her wonderful piece for us, um, Audrey will come back and close us out. So I just wanna thank you all for attending. I love Zoom because I, I have people here who are from out of the state, uh, who are not local. And I am so curious about what their experience has been because we all kind of know each other. This is really a small community. And so anyway, so I thank all of you who are coming from a distance uh, geographically, but clearly not technologically for joining us. So um, Ms. Washington, Jennifer, are you ready to um, make this next tech shift? <laughs> uh, yep, Miss, Mrs. Washington, I'm going to pin your picture so everybody can see you up close and personal and you're unmuted, so you're ready to go. All right, I would like to say thank you for asking me to participate, even <laughs> when I reach the age of 92. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I would like to play for you is a song that was made famous by Magnolia Jackson. And I'm sure all of you recognize it. It um, his eye is on the sparrow, arranged by Mark Hayes.
was beautiful. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Thank you, lovely lady, for the beautiful, his eyes on the sparrow. We appreciate you every time you come before us. We're going to close. And I must say that today's presentation is an excellent start to our new year of educating, evaluating, and growing ourselves in this community. And we want to thank Professor Woods for sharing his vast knowledge with us and his outstanding presentation. We also want to thank Jason, Jason Page and Nisha Revere for assisting us with today's program. And we thank all of you for your attendance, participation, and support. Please look for the dates of our future programs on the Great Migration, the history of protests, and the voting rights. And I'm just gonna close real quick with a quote from Martin Luther King regarding equality. It says, in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their centility of beauty. This calls for a worldwide fellowship that lifts neighborly concerns beyond one's tribe, race, class, and nation is in reality a call for an all embracing and unconditional love for all men. Let's hope we can get there in this lifetime. And I say goodbye, it's been a blessing to serve you today. And I love all of you and God bless you. God Beautiful bless. program. Thank you. Very Thank nice. you very much. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks much. So much. Extremely Thank informational, you. very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Thank you. Program. Faye, I dropped you a invitation. chat message, Faye. Oh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.